Good morning and welcome to Zion on this Pentecost Sunday morning. As we gather in worship today, we will be hearing the Pentecost story from Acts 2 from a variety of different voices tied to our church planting efforts around the world. We will experience the reading of Acts 2 from Jeremiah Korea and as he leads a church in Kenya, from Garigou Kovac, who leads the first new church plant, University Reformed Church in Debrecen, Hungary, the first new church plant in Hungary in 400 years, and Yakub Gurung, who is involved in supporting church planting efforts in Nepal through Jibit Asha, and then finally Chris Winkler, who is um, supporting translation efforts around the world through the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Here are a call to worship from Acts 2 this morning. Hello everybody, I'm going to read for you Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 and I'm going to read it in Swahili and here we go. Hata ilipotimia siku ya Pentecosto walikuwako wote mahali pamoja kukaja ghafla toka mbinguni uvumi. Kama uvumi wa upepo wa nguvu ukienda kazi ukaijasa nyumba yote waliokuwa wameketi. Katoweka ndimi zilizo gawanyika kama ndimi za moto ulio wakalia kila moja wao. Wote wakajazwa roho mtakatifu wakaanza kusema kwa ruga nyingine kama roho alivyo wajaria kutamuka. Asante ni sana. Sok kegyes zsidó férfi élt akkor Jeruzsálemben, akik a föld minden nemzete közül jöttek. Amikor ez a zugás támat, összefutott a sokaság és zavar támat, mert mindenki a maga nyelvén hallotta őket beszélni. Megdöbbentek és csodálkozva mondták, íme akik beszélnek, nem valamennyien Galileából valók-e? Akkor hogyan hallhatja őket mindegyikünk a maga nyelvén? Amiről ilyen párci hörül, mádi hörülről elámi hörül, mesopotamiaká, jehudiaká, kapadókiaká, pontosra esiaká baszindá hörülcsáum. Ani Frigria, Pamphalia, Mr. Kuranima, Porne Libia, Kakati, Chetra Haru, Rombata, Aika Yehudi, Rahudi Mot, Mani Ru Dubei Chong, Kretka Basinda Haru, Rahorabi Hruponi Chong, Ani Hami, Aafna, Hasama, Parmishuka Mahan, Kari Herko Charta, Tini Hule Gareka, Sunday Chong. They stood there, amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. I've been doing a lot of thinking about the Pentecost story over the last week or so, and I am struck by something as we reflect on the story of the Holy Spirit coming, that the disciples first had to have something they loved taken away, the very presence of Jesus, the physical presence of Jesus who ascended into heaven on Ascension Day, had to be taken away before they could receive the Holy Spirit, the thing that they needed to continue the work of God in our world, to begin the spread of the church throughout the world. And I've been struck over the last few weeks that we've had something taken away from us that we love dearly. We love meeting together, we love singing together, we love being the church in one place, gathered together, those relationships, the preaching, the praying, the singing together, we miss those things. But I also wonder if maybe God isn't doing something new in this time like he did on Pentecost. The early church never had big buildings and fancy worship services and sound systems. They gathered in homes. And for 300 years, the church evangelized and discipled and grew in its impact and size and influence for the kingdom of God, gathering in houses. And I wonder if during this time, God wouldn't delight in us if we chose to seek to lean into this new reality, at least for a while, of not being all together in one place and instead focused on our neighborhoods, on discipling and evangelizing in our community. 
Just the, in the last week or so, the governor has begun allowing groups of up to 10 to meet together. I wonder what could happen if we took that opportunity to invite a family in our neighborhood, to invite some people from our small group, to invite someone who's single and alone to come join us for worship so that we could begin experiencing again that smaller, intimate community of the church the way the church grew for 300 years in the Roman Empire and for 50 years in China under the oppressive rule of the communists there, I wonder what God could do here if we embraced that move during this time. We know that God is on the move. As the disciples had to catch up on Pentecost filled by the Holy Spirit, may we, this Pentecost, filled by the Holy Spirit, catch up with the new evangelistic work that God is doing already in our midst. We're so delighted to have you join us this morning. Whether you have attended Zion before in the past, or you're just watching online at your home, or you got invited to someone's house for the day today. Welcome to Zion Reform Church this morning. Our hosts today are Connie Stegeman and Haley Stone. Let me take just a moment to get you oriented a minute. If you're watching online at zionreform.online.church, in the upper right-hand corner, there is a, a upper right-hand corner, there's a give button. Um, if you want to give online, you can give to support the ministers of our church. Um, right below that, there is a chat um, box. If you haven't yet um, welcomed or said hi to everyone, ch check in there and let us know that you're joining us for worship this morning. In the very bottom um, right corner on the bottom of the screen where I'm talking right now, there's a button you can click on to send any prayer request to myself or Pastor Rick. We would love to pray for you throughout the week. If there's something on your heart or mind that you want prayer for, please let us know. As we come into God's presence today, receive his greeting. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's join and worship our God together this morning.
This morning, we continue to celebrate our 2020 high school graduates. Again, I encourage you to reach out to them and congratulate them in any way you can by sending them cards in the mail or texts or anything like that. Hi, I'm Kimberly Verbruggie. Uh, my parents are Rachel Verbruggie, who is the coordinator of Camp Zion, and my dad is Tom Verbruggie, and he does some of the video taping and filming of the church services on Sundays. Um, my grandparents also go to this church, Tom and Marsha Verbruggie, um, so a lot of you probably know them too. Um, and yeah, I'm graduating from Jensen High School, and I'm going to be attending college in the fall. I'm going to be attending Baker College, which is in Muskegon, and I'm going to be majoring in nursing. Um, and I'm going to be hopefully achieving my BSN through um, Baker College, and then I hope to become a pediatric nurse in some specialty at some point in the future. Um, my love for nursing kind of stemmed off from going to this church, from all the times that I was in nursery and children and worship and working at Camp Zion especially. Um, my love for kids and children just kind of blossomed into this really huge passion to take care of them and um, want to base my life around them. So um, something I'm going to really miss um, from senior year, considering all this coronavirus stuff, um, I'm really going to miss having a normal traditional graduation ceremony. Um, <laughs> that's something I always look forward to. And it's unfortunately something that's not going to be completely normal. Um, this year due to circumstances and I also am really sad I missed my senior prom um, that's something I was really <laughs> looking forward to um, but that's okay um let's see I want to give a huge thank you to everybody at this church um, this church made it possible for me to grow tremendously in my faith and in my leadership abilities um, if you would have asked me um, a few years ago whether I would be playing guitar or not, I would probably been like, heck no, <laughs> why, I don't think guitar is in my skill range, um, but just the encouragement and the, um, support that this church and everybody who has been a part of my life throughout this church, um, has given me, has just helped me figure out who I am and what I stand for and helped me achieve all these abilities that I, I didn't even know I had, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, I'm also very thankful for all the opportunities that um, this church has given me to go on amazing trips and experience the wonders of God um, that a lot of people don't get to experience. And I've been fortunate enough to be one of the people who get to um, have that perspective. And um, it's all it's all you guys who made that possible. So I'm very, very thankful. I am also very thankful for all of my youth leaders and all that they have done for me and supporting me and helping me grow my faith throughout all the years in youth group, um, especially Jeremy. Um, he always keeps pushing me and pushing me and helping me figure out the next level, the next thing that I can achieve and the all the cool things that I didn't even know how to do. Um, he's always helping me push me one step further in my faith and I'm so, so thankful for that. So thank you, Jeremy and all my youth leaders. I love you guys. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much to the whole Zion community. Um, I've loved being a part of this church and I can't wait to continue being a part of it um, throughout this next season of my life. So thank you. Kimberly, you are such a joy to be around. You have such a positive attitude that spreads to everyone around you. You care for friends and family so well and you're just incredibly gifted with kids. You have a pure heart of gold. There are very few people in this world who have such good character and heart like you have. I'm so glad that for this graduate Sunday or Sundays that all of this is pre-recorded because if we were doing this in front of the sanctuary live, um, if I hadn't cried yet in front of all the other graduates, by the time I got to you, I would not be able to make it through the talk. And that's probably because I've spent more time hanging out with you and investing in you than I have any other student that has come through our youth group. Because if we had a retreat or mission trip, you were always there. If we had youth group on Sunday, you were there. If there was an opportunity to serve, you were there. 
You were a part of the worship team for so many years. You volunteered at Camp Zion every summer before you could come on staff. You just were always involved in so many things. And Kimberly, you've grown so much over the years. You've accepted each and every one of the challenges that I've given you and you've stepped up in leadership. You were the first of the younger kids to start singing and then actually leading songs in worship at Zion. And it started this huge wave of other youth who got involved because you did. They saw that what you were doing was safe and that they were encouraged that they could lead well too because of what you did. Um, I asked you to come on our, as a high schooler onto our middle school mission trip in Holland as a worship leader. And you did such a great job organizing and planning all the worship music for both morning and evening throughout the whole trip, encouraging middle school students, um, just telling them how great they were and giving them the confidence to be able to lead well, giving everyone a spot to be able to worship, and also um, getting up front and leading well in worship is just showing them how to lead well in worship. Um, you took the role of Camp Zion staff very seriously, and I saw you grow so much from that. Um, every day, you just gave the kids your all, and you became this voice that kids respected. You could command the full group of like 70 kids and the staff and volunteers. And I remember um, one of the years, there was a week where I think that your mom was sick and you pretty much stepped up took over and you organized, you led the morning meetings, um, and you just kind of took the role of Camp Zion director for a few days. And you did that so well while your mom was gone. Um, this past fall, you were asked to step up and do a talk for our fall retreat to teach. And you did that well. You shared your heart with the group about friendship. You came as a student leader this, on this past middle school winter retreat, and you naturally, of course, took leadership to the next level. Like I saw you lead in a way you hadn't even before. You just brought so much energy and passion into the group. You connected different uh, students together, different grades were hanging out with each other and different cliques were, were meshing together because of what you and Olivia and Josh were able to do um, just by being who you were and leading well. It was so cool to see. And you've taken worship to the next level. Even more so recently, you started playing guitar, what, last fall? and you're already able to record and lead our church in worship, leading that song, Raise a Hallelujah, alongside of your brother and your mom. What a cool moment to see the three of you leading that song and the giftedness that God has given you and the drive that you have to learn and to grow and to um, lead people in worship like that. Kimberly, you have been a gift to me and a gift to the people of Zion. You have caused people to grow in their relationship with God through the way that you worship and the way that you lead and the way that you love others. You have already made more of an impact on the kingdom of God than most people do in their entire lives. And since you're graduating now and moving on, and you won't always have youth leaders to push and challenge you, I want to encourage you to keep pushing and challenging yourself. Whenever you're afraid or are feeling insecure, I want you to look back over the last few years to see how God has been faithful, to see how you've accomplished more than you thought you ever could to remember the confidence God has given you, how God has been with you through it all, giving you everything that you need. And God will continue to be faithful as you continue to serve. And if ever you fall or fail, and you will, 
know that you don't have to be perfect, that everyone makes mistakes, that everyone is in need of God's good grace. So just keep on going because God is going to continue to do great things through you as long as you just keep opening yourself up to him. I'm so proud of you, Kimberly, and I'm going to miss you so much. So you better visit and you better make some guest appearances to lead us in worship because we're all going to miss you. Congratulations, Kimberly. I have just a couple of announcements for you this morning. First, we'd like to invite you to join us for coffee following worship. We'll post a link to the Zoom call in the chat box right now. You can come with whatever beverage of choice you might have. We'd love just to see one another face to face and talk with each other for a few minute moments this morning. And then second, we'd like to encourage you to continue giving both food and personal care items to Zion. We are collecting on Wednesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. The food items are being distributed through Sunrise Ministries as they can continue leading an effort um, to distribute food in Georgetown Township, and the personal care items will be sent to Lifeline Community Church as they are organizing a giveaway in um, Wyoming as we continue supporting our church plant there. And then I'd also like to invite you to join us for a COVID-19 Town Hall for Zion. Um, on Thursday night at 7 p.m. this week. It will be a Zoom call. It'll be online. We'll record it so we can share it later via our Facebook page. But I want to invite you to come to this because I've had many conversations with people in the last few weeks who tell me they don't know who to believe anymore. They don't know what to trust. They don't know whether to take things seriously or not. They're confused. And so we've organized from members of our church a panel of people who are medical experts in West Michigan. They know what's happening in our hospitals and in primary care physician practices and what's going on with surgeries. They can give a lot of information from people that you know and trust. We have a panel of Ken Johnson and Tracy Lobas and Janelle Vanderwall and Amy Mott. It's going to be a great night from 7 to 8 on Thursday. If you have questions that you want asked, um, send an email to me. Um, at gbrowerzionreformed.org and we'll include them in our list. Otherwise, you can ask them that night, but to not put our panel too much on the spot, we'd like to give them a preview of some of the questions. So please join us on Thursday at 7 p.m. for a COVID-19 town hall to answer some of the questions that you might be having. And then this morning, um, we come to our Lord in prayer. Let us come to God in prayer this morning. Holy and awesome God, when we consider the beauty of your creation, the vastness of the universe, the diversity of animals and plants, we stand in wonder. And yet we know you are not just a creative God, but also one of truth and justice with a heart that breaks for the oppressed. For when you came to live among us, you lived among the poor. You preached good news to the enslaved, and you stood condemned with the political prisoners and protesters of your day. As citizens of the wealthiest and militarily most powerful nation in the world, we often identify most easily with those who condemned you rather than with those you came to deliver. We fail to see the oppression around us. We fail to empathize with those who try to show us their experience. We fail to give weight to the ongoing effects of the slavery, oppression, and discrimination of the past and the reality of that oppression yet today. But this morning we repent and we commit to live differently. We thank you for the gift of prophets who cry out for justice and mercy. Open our ears to hear them and to follow the truth they speak, lest we support injustice and secure our own well-being in the process. Give prophets the fire of your word, but fill them with the, the fire of your love as well. We pray for our African-American brothers and sisters who live in a very different America than many of us do. Give them strength, give them hope, give them courage, and keep them safe. We pray as well today for the many affected by the coronavirus and our response to it. For families who grieve, give peace and comfort. For medical workers exhausted from long shifts, give strength. For those who have lost their jobs and are not sure where to even look for a new job, give wisdom and hope. For those struggling with anxiety and depression, give peace. 
for those who cannot be with their loved ones in nursing homes or in the hospital and who sit home and worry. Give confidence in your care and provision. Father, in the midst of so much turmoil and fear, we give you thanks as well for homes and family, for good health, for food to eat, and for both the gift of your spirit, which we celebrate today, and the new life we have found in your son. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. In a famous scene in the old movie City Slickers, Billy Crystal um, has a conversation with a cowboy as they're driving the cattle. That is a movie all about middle age and finding your purpose in life. And he asks this cowboy, what's the meaning of life? And the cowboy says, it's this. It's one thing. What's the one thing in your life that motivates, that drives everything else that you do? What's the one thing that you find gives meaning in your life? That's what we're going to be talking about today. What is your one thing in life that motivates, that drives you, that you were made to do or be? Now, I want to start with my assumption today. My assumption is that you are a follower of Jesus. And so your primary one thing is that you want to love and serve God with all of your life. You want to give glory to him. You want to obey his commands. You want to be a disciple of Jesus. That is the primary calling. That's what we talked about in the first um, several weeks of this sermon series. But what I want to focus on today is not just that primary calling, but the secondary one of what is your who are you? What's your be? What is your do? What are you called to do? How has God made you? That's what we talked about last week and the week before. And then this week, where is God placing you? What is your position that God has called you to be in? And so today, as we conclude the sermon series, we turn back to our theme verse for this series in Ephesians 2.10, where Paul says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's workmanship. That is our be, right? This is who we are, our identity. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. We've been created for a reason. There's something we should do with the gifts that we have been given. And now we need to walk in them. That is our position. It's our mission. We need to go somewhere. God sent Moses to, back to Egypt. He sent Abraham back to Canaan. God sent Jonah to Nineveh. God is a God who sends. But today I want to challenge you to think of your position not just as going, but it could also be a particular thing you're called to, like you have a passion for affordable housing. It could be a cause. It could be a people group, like you have a, a heart for single moms. Or it could be um, a, a particular skill set that you bring to a variety of areas. But what is your go? Maybe it's a place in the world. Maybe it's your neighborhood or your school. What is the go? What is the place that God has called you? As we do that today, I want to give you a visual to help you think about all of the things it could be. So I have two kids in my house right now who are heading in, are in high school or heading into high school. And so we're starting to have conversations about what, what could you do with your life. And thankfully, I have wonderful kids. And so they have all sorts of things that they could do in their lives. Like we could drum like this. They have all these options that they have ahead of them in life that they could pick. They can do all of those things. But what we want to do is we think about our mission from God, our position, is narrow that down from all the can-dos down to the bottom of the funnel of what's your one must do. What is the thing that God has created in you that burns in you that you simply have to do in order to be faithful to God? What is the must do in your life? So today, as we think about all of the can-dos you have, and if you're like most people, there's lots of things you can do. There are more opportunities for you to serve, for you to work, for you to bless other people than you can follow up on. There are more options than there is time available to you. So the question for all of us is not simply what can I do, but how do I narrow down all the can-dos into the one or two things I must do to be faithful to God. How do I narrow it down to that one or two things? So let me suggest just a couple of ideas for you. 
And as we're going through this, take time as I'm talking to think about maybe your job or maybe it's a volunteer opportunity or some role you serve and how that fits in your life. All right, take time to think about that and, and assess where you are in, in a couple of different criteria. So the first thing I want you to think about is, does it fit your values? Take time to determine if the work or organization you're volunteering or working in fits with your values. It's one thing to be good at something and to make good money at it. It is another to love what you do because that work makes your heart sing. When I was in my 20s, I worked for a consulting firm designing executive compensation plans for big companies. Over 20 years ago now, the positions I consulted on almost all made over $500,000 a year in base salary plus bonuses plus stock options. These are people making way more money than I will ever make in my life. The job paid great. It was intellectually challenging. I got to travel. There were a lot of things I really liked about this job. But if you know me at all, and you know my concern for those who are on the lower end of the income scale, you can see why that job just didn't fit very well for me. Take time to consider if the job you do, the organization you serve, fits your values or if there is a significant disconnect there. I can attest that it is better to earn less money even 20 years later and do what you love than it is to earn a lot of money and feel like a square peg in a round hole. There are people who are made to do what I used to do and their heart would sing from it and God bless them for being made that way. It wasn't how he made me. Assess, does this work fit the values that God has shaped you to hold? And then second, consider if your job fits your personality. Some people love and need to be outside, while others would rather work inside in a sterile environment. Other people need lots of people around, and some of us want lots of time alone. Some people like change and innovation, while others like to do the same thing day after day after day. Some people want to follow, and some people long to lead. Does the work you're doing fit how God wired you. This is a great insight from Jen Hatmaker's um, recent new book as she talks about women who are, as she calls it, mega women and modest women and mezzo women. And no matter which one you are, our culture says you should be one of the others, it feels like. But we need to learn to embrace how God made us, whether we're a big personality and want to be up front or want to be behind the scenes. That is a good thing. There are good ways to follow and serve God with all different personalities. But it's hard to serve if what you're doing doesn't fit how God made you. Does it fit your personality? The first church I ever served was in Colorado. I was the associate pastor, and Phil Schuling was the lead pastor. Phil was a pastor's pastor, as in literally other pastors came to him for him to be their pastor. He was a chaplain to the fire department. He was a gifted pastor to the congregation of New Hope Community Church. It was, he was great at being with people and helping them see God at work in their lives. It was a huge privilege to work with Phil at that church. I learned so much about being a pastor from working with him. About a year into being at the church, we had a consistory retreat to clarify our vision and direction as a church. And the next time I preached, I talked about the vision and the direction. I was so excited, I couldn't wait to tell people where we thought we might be going. It never even occurred to me that that was Phil's job and not mine. I clearly overstepped my bounds. But of course, as Phil commented afterwards, he had never even thought about telling people what we thought we ought to be doing. It wasn't in his nature to be a, a leader in that way of casting vision in, in, for, for the church. I learned in that moment that I loved Phil and I learned a ton from him. And they were a wonderful church, but I was not a very good associate pastor. I wanted to be in his seat. And so I wound up with all of you and I'm so glad that happened. Take the time to figure out if the role you're in, whether it's a job or you're volunteering, fits who you really are. I struggled for two years in Colorado, even though it was a great church, because my role didn't fit my, me very well. Personality and work style matters. 
And then third, take time to assess your season of life. When you have young kids in the house, it's probably not the best time to, make a, to take a job that requires you to travel three weeks out of every month. When you're paying for kids to go to college, it's probably not the time to go back to college or to transition to a lower paying job. You probably need to pay for college. Take the time to assess your season of life. I'm not always very good at this. There are always more things I could be doing, more opportunities I want to pursue that, that sound fun, that I want to do, and I've learned I don't have that much time. I don't have time to pursue all of those opportunities. And after a season of, of experiencing some genuine burnout, where even reading the Bible felt like work and uh, like a burden to me, I have learned that I need to consider my season of life, and I'm in a great season with four kids in my house and all of the energy and the activity that comes with that, but it means my energy needs to go there and here at church and not too many other things. I have to be more focused on this season in those places. If you're an empty nester, maybe you have more time or energy for those other things. If you're single or without kids, you might have energy for lots of other things. Consider your season of life as you think through all of the can-dos to narrow down to your must-do. And then, before you make major changes, live into that must-do in small steps first. Experiment. Take small risks before you make a big jump. If you're thinking about becoming a missionary to Ethiopia, go there first on a short-term mission trip to see what it's like there. If you're dreaming of running a cool and trendy coffee shop or restaurant, go work in one. Go interview the manager and job shadow them to see what it's really like to be in that industry. Take small steps to learn more before you disrupt all of your life and the lives of those that you love. This is one of the keys of designers. They, they experiment and they try new things, but they don't have to break everything apart to do that. It's a wisdom from the book, Designing Your Life. Take small steps. Experiment. Try some new things. Another way to think of this funnel is to imagine a path snaking its way up a mountain. It goes around and around and around, slowly climbing the mountain, but also continually passing the same point over and over at a slightly higher elevation. Most of us don't figure out our one thing when we're 15 or when we're 20 or even when we're 25 or 30. For many of us, we aren't ready to know what our one thing might be until we're in our 40s or our 50s. It's hard to know. It takes maturity and life experience to be able to discern all of these things. For many people, though we think that as we get older, now it's too late, we've missed our opportunity. If that's where you are, if you're in your, your late 50s, your 60s or 70s, let, let's pause a moment. And remember that though when we're younger, life is all about accomplishing those who develop wisdom over time learn in their later years that it's even more impactful long-term to invest in those who come after them, to mentor and develop others along the way. For many people, their greatest impact comes not from what they do personally in their 20s and 30s and 40s, but from what those they mentored and discipled and trained do when they're now in their 70s or 80s and their disciples or in their 30s and 40s and 50s. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 92. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. This is my prayer for our church, whether you are old or young, that you would continue to bear fruit in your youth and all through old age as you live into the calling God has given you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you have shaped and formed us, and we ask that you would help us to seek your will, to seek your call in our lives, that we might find the one thing we must do that you have made us to do, that we might bear the fruit you've called us to bear in our lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
As we continue our worship together this morning, we have the privilege of bringing our gifts and offerings to God. We'd encourage you during our offering song to give generously designed. If God is leading you to do so, you can do so um, by giving online in the upper right-hand corner or by mailing a check design or setting electronic giving up through our office as well. Um, thank you so much for your generous support of our church at, the, at this time.
May you go with the blessing of our God. May God be gracious to you and bless you and cause his face to shine on you that his ways may be known on earth, his salvation among all the nations. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Wash your hands and stay safe.